Another year of defense early. I mean, maybe. Is it fixed yet? What's up, everybody? Welcome to another episode of Lombardi Time Bruiser. I'm your host, John Delray. On this gorgeous Friday, we're talking Packers defense and the thresholds that Brian Goodekunst has proven to use. Now, as I said in Monday's video, if you've not yet checked out part one, go check that out. It covers all the offense position by position, and I talk about why I'm doing this, you know, Ron Wolf to Ted Thompson and now to Brian Goodekins, because we've learned a lot about who the Packers like and maybe have scribbled off of their board as we get into the draft. So today, the defense position by position, talking about what the Packers look for, but then also a few fits. Uh, one in the earlier round, one generally in the late round is about what I'm doing for every position. Now, just to say there are a few things that I want to get off right at the top. One, why am I doing this? Because everyone, every creator, even a lot of fans, just talk about the Packers thresholds. The fact that Goot seems so beholden to this list of ideals in the draft. And yet when you try to look them up, it can get really tricky. And there's a lot of variance out there. So what I did between my own work and the work of many others, the different articles that I read and different things like that, I've compiled what I believe to be a consensus listing of all of the thresholds for position by position. And I've been very open about the fact that I've been using work by like Brian Moffey from his Decoding the Packer Way series. Uh, Acme Packing Company has had a couple articles out where they've discussed in fact, they just put one out earlier this week. That was their thresholds in their mind, Packer Report, et cetera. And all of the articles that I used for research for this video, I've actually linked in the description of this video if you want to go check them out as well. So another thing that I want to address is these are basic guidelines. Basically, if the Packers generally choose an edge rusher who's like 275 pounds, and then they pick one who's 230 we can say that that's a pretty strong outlier, right? And that's what this is really going for, identifying what the Packers' trends are so that we can be more informed, a little bit more predictive of when it actually comes to the draft, what they may do. And then the other thing that I really want to acknowledge quick is, yes, the Packers, they do use their own system, probably not Raz, but they certainly use a system close to it in evaluating players. And then because we're talking defense today, I do just want to acknowledge that it is a new day in Green Bay. This is based most heavily, of course, on what Brian Gutekunst has done since he took over as GM in 2018. But a lot of these things go all the way back to Ron Wolf in the early 90s, Ted Thompson and his long era. So for a lot of those years, especially more recently, right? Like going Dom Capers on through the Packers have been a three, four defense. Well, now with Jeff Hafley, they're going to be four, three for the first time in a full football generation. And yes, I fully understand that that is the base and they're going to use other stuff even more than they use base. And there's going to be heavy four, two, five nickel, like they did with Joe Barry. There's even probably going to be multiple sets with Hafley five, two, four, six might even make their way back into the fold, which are things that we haven't seen in a while. So what that may mean is that we could be on the precipice of a new way of drafting defense in Green Bay. But Dom Capers, yes, he ran a 3-4. Joe Barry, he ran a 3-4. Mike Pettin a 3-4 as well. For most positions, we have not seen, be it Ted Thompson, be it Brian Gutekunst, we have not seen great wavering away from the draft principles, regardless who, who has been the defensive coordinator. And that is kind of opposite. We believe that Joe Barry did probably want some things different based upon his coaching track record than Mike Pettin. And yet, Goot just kept on drafting away with the ideals that they've shown to use. So, will things change under Halfley? We ultimately don't know. Is it possible? Yes, 100%. But they haven't really done it that much before. So, we will see. What we do know is what they've done before who they brought in for top 30 visits. I covered on Monday why that's important. And then also what the athletic testing is for all of the prospects. So let's talk what they have done before. The last time that they chose each one of these positions in round one, obviously last year, Edge was Lucas Van Ness, uh, interior defensive lineman and inside linebacker. That was the 2022 draft that they last chose these guys in a first round, Devontae Wyatt, Quay Walker. The last time that they chose a corner in round one was Eric Stokes, 2021. And then 
2019 was the last time that they chose a safety in round one. Darnell Savage, all obviously a lot more recent than some of the offensive listings that went back to like 1987. So certainly different for the defensive side of the ball. And then, as I was saying, with those top 30 visits, I recapped why those have become so important in recent drafts. Well, now let's just take a look at the defenders that have brought in four top 30 visits thus far. And this is current as of today. Even as I'm saying this all, there might be another one being reported now. But this is what we've got for right now. Omar Brown, the defensive back from Nebraska. Jerry and Jones, the corner out of Florida State. Michael Hall Jr., the defensive lineman out of Ohio State. Edrin Cooper, linebacker, Texas A&M. Christian Boyd, the defensive lineman from Northern Iowa. Trevin Wallace, linebacker from Kentucky. Jaquan Shepard, corner from Maryland. Keaton Oladapo, I, he's one of my favorite players in the draft, and I just seem to slip up that name every single time. I'm sorry. He's from Oregon State. Tyron Harper, linebacker from Missouri. Chris Edmonds, the defensive back out of Arizona State. Bryce Gallagher, linebacker out of Northwestern. Kool-Aid McKinstry, the corner out of Alabama. Gabriel Murphy, the edge out of UCLA. Akeem Dent, safety out of Florida State. Austin Booker, the edge out of Kansas. And Mason Smith, the big defensive tackle out of LSU, the most recent on the lips, perhaps. So... Let's talk what many people to be consider the most important position on the defensive side of the ball. The players that Brian Gutekunst has drafted here include Lucas Van Ness, Kingsley Enigbari, Jonathan Garvin, Rashawn Gary, and Kendall Donerson. And this is one position where Raz really seems to take precedence even more than others. Of the five selections that Brian Gutekunst has made at this position, four of them have at least Raz of 8.98, with Kingsley and Igbari the lone holdout at 6.24. If you're super unfamiliar, Raz is basically 0 to 10, or 9.99 in the case of most things, but the higher you get, the closer you get to 10, the more perfect of an athlete you are in that position's history, dating back to the data that goes back to 1987. So 8.98 and above for 80% of these selections means that Brian Gutekunst is very purposefully trying to choose the best possible athletes that he can. In terms of sheer size, the Packers, oh, they like them big. Generally, in terms of height, 6'4 or bigger even. Weight, the preference definitely seems to be about 265 but they have made a couple selections in the 250s before. I would feel safe saying that anyone under 250 would be a pretty significant anomaly or for Halfley in the future, perhaps a change. Arms, everyone that Brian Goodekunst has drafted has had arms over 33 inches long. I don't think that's a coinky dink. I think that's a true trend that he looks for. As for the athletic testing, we're looking for a broad jump of about 10 feet or more. Shuttle. The preference seems to be 4.4 or less. And for three cone, the preference seems to be 7.3 seconds or faster. In terms of some fits here, an early round fit, I think one of the most packery types of players in this draft would be Marshawn Nealand. In terms of the later rounds, one prospect that I think stands a chance to be looked at by Green Bay would be Brennan Jackson out of Washington State, although he is just a little over on his three cone testing. And again, doesn't mean he won't be picked because these are guys. Moving on to the defensive line. These are the bigger ones. Players drafted by Goot here would include last year, Kobe Wooden and Carl Brooks, but also Devontae Wyatt, TJ Slayton, Jonathan Ford, Kingsley Kiki, and James Looney, who was drafted as a defensive lineman, but then he did some work at other positions, including tight end. He was a seventh round pick. They just tried everything with that and it just didn't. And already, if you can tell, there are several different types of players here, several different types of athletes. This, along with tight end, seems to be one of the looser threshold spots on the team. They seem at times to be more forgiving with the thresholds that they do have when the player has great college productivity, like in the case of the picture there, Carl Brooks. But one thing that they do seem to value, especially in the fourth round or earlier, so if we're talking in early round pick, they do really seem to value an explosive first step or testing that would seem to indicate a player being able to develop an explosive first step. Those players generally also seem to have the highest RAS out of the picks. I know, shocking, but it seems like a lot of the time when they choose defensive linemen, it's almost like the later in the draft you get, the more they're willing to sidestep their normal preferences. In terms of size, we're looking for guys who are generally six foot two or more. 
And then wait, there's some big discrepancies here. If they're a bulky type, let's go with like DJ Slayton, they want them to be 287 plus. In the case of Carl Brooks, he was just over 300 pounds. But if they are a leaner body type, like last year's other pick, Kobe Wooden, then the absolute bottom that they're willing to go for the defensive line seems to be about 270 or more. Arms, 31 inches and longer seems to be a pretty strong cutoff as neither Brian nor Ted have really ever veered into the 30-inch arm territory. In terms of athletic thresholds, there are a couple of trends. And again, I say trends, not super strong thresholds because this is, this is a position littered with exceptions. At broad jump, they're looking about nine feet. But Carl Brooks, he does stand out as a pretty strong exception here, just over eight feet. It was a great deviance in the data. In terms of the 40, they're looking for guys who run at about 5'1 or under, certainly with a preference under 5. And then for the three cone, they're looking for 7.65, being a pretty strong preference. And 7.9, seeming like it might be a true threshold that they don't want over 7.9. In terms of fits here, Byron Murphy the second out of Texas. And I, there's still somehow continued talk that he may drop in the draft. And I know BFF's mock draft simulator frequently has him dropping 225. I don't know. Most consensus seems he's going to go pretty higher than that, but he would indeed obviously fit what the Packers are looking for in the defensive line. Then with some later round selections, let's take a look at Jaden Crumity out of Mississippi State. Although, yeah, his broad jump is kind of Carl Brooks-esque. Apparently it doesn't bother them too much when they have college production. Now let's take a look at the next position, this one being off-ball linebacker. The Packers have selected here since 2018 Quay Walker, Isaiah McDuffie, Kamal Martin, Ty Summers, and Oren Burks. As pertaining to Raz, three of the four drafted with complete Raz had 9.6 or higher. We're talking about some of the best athletes ever at the position. I mean, Isaiah McDuffie was the lowly 7.32 exception here. Keep in mind for this testing, Kamal Martin did not have a complete RAS. So in terms of being able to say 75% of them at 9.6 or higher, we're talking Quay Walker, uh, Ty Summers, Oren Burks. In terms of height, the shortest one has been six foot one. Seems like they really want to get over that. In terms of weight, the preference seems to be about 240, but they have been willing to dip into the 230s. Uh, the only ones that really were like under 230 were like 229. So nothing that a cheese curd and a regular beer wouldn't fix. That's really what they're looking for. 240 seems to be a pretty strong preference, though, as they do like them a little bit larger. In terms of their arm size, we're looking 30 inches. Seems to be a pretty strong minimum. Most of them pretty easily clear 31. Vertical, 32-inch minimum seems to be a big deal, as does the broad jump with a 10-foot minimum. 40 and three cone are really the two other tests that really stood out to me. For the 40, you're looking at a 4.6 second. Seems to be a cutoff. Absolutely no one was higher than 461. And for the three cone, this seems like a pretty strong trend. Seven seconds or faster. Uh, guys who may fit the categories here, earlier round players being Trevin Wallace, although he did not test for agility, and he was brought in for a top 30 visit. Edrin Cooper, who the Packers have rumored interest in and was brought in for a top 30 visit. He fits most of the categories or he's really close to the ones that he doesn't fit. And then one guy who does fit basically all of them would be Peyton Wilson. But as we've noted before, with his medical history being 24 years old, there's a litany of other red flags on him. In terms of later round fits, you could look at Jordan McGee. He fits every single one, even though he's anticipated to be on day three. But then also there's Jalen Ford out of Texas, if they are willing to bend on speed just a little bit. For cornerbacks, a more exciting position. Players drafted here include Carrington Valentine, Shamar John Charles, Eric Stokes, Kadar Holman, and Jair Alexander. The height this is an interesting topic because there seems to be some leeway here. Uh, and Brian Moffey did some nice deep diving into this. He said that 5'10", 5'10 seems like the absolute bottom. Okay, let's say that. They have not picked corners who are 5'9 or under. So let's go 5'10 as an absolute cutoff. But as Moffey actually notes, Goot's willing to go shorter than Ron Wolf or Ted Thompson ever were as they basically demanded that their draft picks had to be 5'10 and a half whereas Goot is willing to go with more of a pure 5'10". Look, I know that sounds unbelievably trivial, but 
it seems to matter. It really does. When you look over the history of these draft picks, these trends, these thresholds, it seems pretty clear. In terms of weight, they seem to really like their corners to be 193 plus, which is pretty darn big for a corner. Carrington Valentine was right on 193 himself. Jay Alexander was the noted exception down there in kind of the lower mid 180s. And it was talked about when he was drafted that he was more so an exception to the rule, not a new rule. In terms of arms, they do want them to be 31 inches or more. That seems pretty clear. Broad, again, 10 foot plus. Vertical, a minimum of 35 inches. In terms of the 40, this one seems pretty strict. Four, five, six, or faster. And then also for the three cone, the vast majority of them, both Brian and Ted's picks, run it in faster than six, nine. In terms of fits, early round fit would be Cooper DeGene, although he did not test for agility. He was off the charts and everything else. And then also Max Melton. Shout out, by the way, to my friends at Wisco Fanatics who were on Max Melton so much earlier than other uh, hacker people. He does seem like a great fit for their thresholds. A later round candidate would actually be Andrew Phillips, former teammate of Carrington Valentine in Kentucky, but he's just a touch over on the three cone. He meets everything else very well. Next, and our last position of the day, let's take a look at the safeties. And honestly, there's just not a ton of data here because partially this is a group that Brian Goodekunst picks so late in the draft generally with one very large exception, and it's only four guys that he's drafted. One, last year, Anthony Johnson Jr., but then also Tariq Carpenter, Vernon Scott, and Darnell Savage. Three of them day three picks, and then Darnell Savage, the standout in round one of 2019. In terms of height, there seems to be a pretty strong preference to go over six feet, but they did dip down all the way to 5'10 for Darnell Savage. And I will say, too, Darnell Savage, you're going to hear me say that a few times, he is by far the smallest of the safeties that Brian Kudekunst has picked and was even small by a lot of Ted Thompson's standards. Kind of an exception there. And he had some flashes, but for the most part, we've kind of seen how that worked out. In terms of weight, the Packers seem to want all of their safeties to be 200 plus pounds. That seems to be the ideal. Arms, 31 inches plus. Again, Darnell Savage, an anomaly there, or I should say the absolute cutoff. And then minimum with Brian Goodekunst, the absolute minimum for the vert has been 37 inches. A, uh, very good vertical, especially for safeties. And then looking at the broad 10 feet, uh, the 44 six seems to be a pretty strong uh, cutoff for the Packers and much over four, six. They're not even going to look at you. And then short shuttle seems to be four, three, six or under. And I didn't put it on the sheet here, but with a three cone, the vast majority are under seven with three carpenter really standing out at seven, five. We know that eventually they actually switched him to inside linebacker in terms of fits here. Probably the most ideal fit in the draft when it happens to align really well with their needs would be Cole Bishop from Utah. But then later, one prospect who I do, do think deserves a lot of attention for Packer people would be Dominic Hampton as he fits all of the thresholds as well. So I know certainly a quicker episode today. And uh, Really, ultimately, I just want to say here that, you know, it's not absolute said that a lot. And I just feel the need to stress it because so many people get hung up on looking at draft candidates. Every so often this even happens in a live Q&A, you know, they'll say things along the lines of like, well, you know, they like him to be 265. He's 255. Well, yeah, that that's a lot of these are the preferences. Now, there are some things that do seem to be hard cutoffs. Like I just said with the safeties, if you're going to run a 4740, chances are the Packers aren't going to look at you because it's just not the way the Packers have historically done business. They would have to have exemplary production or an out of the world Raz and other categories in order for the Packers to really entertain potentially picking them. For the most part, most Packers that you're going to see are going to meet the vast majority of these thresholds or be really close to them. If the Packers pick someone who's outside of most of these thresholds, we can say with some real confidence that it's a historical anomaly. So I know it's shorter than today or the other day, but I just want to say that's it. That is it. For the Packers, thresholds covered every position, offense and defense. No, I'm not doing thresholds for special teams. 
But I will say, please do join us upcoming just a couple weeks now from Is the Draft. And Claudia and I are going to be here. We're going to be here for every single minute of all seven rounds. We're going to be live streaming the entire thing here to chat with you. We made it a goal last year. Goal we actually achieved last year at the draft for all seven rounds. We answered every single listener comment that there was. So please join us. That is our goal again this year. Let's hang out. Let's talk Packers. Let's just have fun over one of the most fun NFL weekends that there is in the year. Also, be on the lookout Monday as I'll be putting out a video covering day three prospects or later round prospects. I hate the term sleepers in the draft world now because like, are there really sleepers anymore with how much the draft is covered? But talking day three prospects that very well might be of consideration for the Packers or at the very least maybe should be. The uh, guy that you saw on the safety screen there, Anthony Johnson Jr., <laughs> he was one of them last year. So please do join me on Monday for that. I do hope everyone out there has a great weekend. Thanks for joining me today. And as always, go Pack Go.